Welcome to my narrated step-by-step -step tutorial for my painting Lobster Shack. This is version one of three limited palette. The second version is of the same subject matter but done with color accents and version three is the same subject matter but done using local color. The photo on the right of this lobster shack is the reference and the inspiration for my painting series. The painting on the left is version one, the subject matter painted with a limited palette. I begin with a sketch of the major components of the composition. You can see the building with some windows on it, indication where the rocks and water are and some trees, but there's not much more detail than that. To begin painting, I'm using a half inch flat brush and I'm using a mid-value wash that is a mixture of sap green and royal blue. And um, I'm, I'm taking this mid-value wash and I'm going to start painting the, the shadow side of uh, some of the buildings in this composition. I like this color mixture that I'm using and I use it uh, sometimes when I'm doing a uh, limited palette painting. I think one of the nice things, it's, it's a pleasant color and it acts kind of like a grayscale. It allows you to explore the full value range but it has just a little bit of color into it so it's not just gray. And um, I think doing a limited palette painting is especially useful for a beginner who is still trying to get a handle on how to apply washes and how to gradate washes and how to explore the value scale with watercolor because you don't get caught up so much into worrying about the colors that you're using all over your painting. You can focus on value contrast, you can focus on hard soft edges, you can work in negative space, and a limited palette painting um, just makes it uh, easier I think to practice and learn some of those concepts. With this painting right now I'm focused on my values and I'm putting in um, mid-ranged values on what I consider to be the shadow side of the structures and in this composition but I'm not worried about what color is the building I'm just worried about lights and darks and uh, I can see how effectively I'm putting down my washes without some of the confusion of worrying about color. So again, I think this is just a, a good approach if you're beginning watercolorist and you're trying to get down some of the basic fundamentals uh, and then bring, bring in more color as you feel comfortable or just do a few like this. But it's a good way to learn some of the fundamentals of watercolor. It's not that color isn't important. You'll hear me talk about value contrast a lot. And uh, color, they're both important design elements. There's a number of design elements. But when you're trying to learn some of the fundamentals, you can't worry about every element of design, every principle of design, and focus on learning some of the basic techniques. So that's why I think it's good just to focus uh, on as few as possible so that you can focus on the technical side of the medium and learning how it handles how to apply washes and value contrast I feel is one of the most if not the most important design element because you can have an effective painting with uh, a, a grayscale or a limited palette such as this but it's very difficult to have a successful piece without value contrast. So far I've done all my painting with this half inch flat brush and this middle value wash. And you can see I've let the wash go from one shape to the other without any break or separation. And it gives the opportunity for me to have lost edges in my composition. So I've been, I start with some of the larger shapes and the little by little I'll work down to more detail and I'll uh, start working with darker values. And as I do start to work with the darker values and smaller shapes, I'll start to create some separation and have some breaks between these shapes, but I'll still let some of them be lost edges and leave it for the viewer's eye to complete. In some of my paintings, uh, especially some of my landscapes, I'll use masking fluid to create texture 
or preserve highlights if I'm doing big washes. But in this instance, I'm not using any masking fluid. I'm just uh, painting around the white space uh, to save those areas. This is where a flat brush works nice when you're working around building structures like this because it gives a nice crisp clean edge and you can uh, keep those uh, highlights, those white highlights on some of the edges of buildings and, and different areas a little easier than you can with a round brush I feel. But it lays down a nice even tone and again at this point I still just use this one brush. And you can now start to see the building structure uh, starting to take shape. And really, all I've done is paint some of the negative space and paint the shadow side of the buildings and some of the areas underneath. But they are really a large shape of a mid-value. And then as I work further into my painting process, I'll start to define some of these areas more with some darker values. At this point, I'm starting to define that tree line a little bit more, and uh, there's a little bit of wet on wet uh, brushwork that I'm doing there. So my my wash is down, but I'm coming back in with a, a loaded brush into the wet area, and I'm letting that run down a little bit and um, mingle with the wash that I've already have on there. You'll often see me blot my paper with a tissue to pick up excess water, or Sometimes I do it just to create an interesting textural quality in my wash. I want to create a little more interest in the sky, so I'm coming in with a one inch flat brush with the uh, middle value, maybe a little bit more water in it, but uh, just putting down some brush marks in the sky to give the indication of clouds. And I'm going to come in with uh, my fine mist spray bottle. And I'm going to soften up this wash that I've put in there. And I like the effect it gives me. It kind of uh, makes it feel more cloud-like, less hard edge. Now I'm going to start working on some smaller detail areas, start working at smaller shapes. I start working with darker values and I'm going to do my uh, detail brush work using this quill brush that I like to use. It's a nice brush, it's an inexpensive brush but it holds a lot of paint and it comes to a, a nice sharp point. You'll see if you look close when I do shapes such as these windows, I like to have a little variety in that that shape, that darker shape and some variation in values and I like to break up my brush marks. I don't want to just paint a bunch of squares in a in a rectangle and call it a window. So I, I leave some areas incomplete and just touch the corners and other areas and just try and make it a, a little more interesting just than just flat painted squares. Now I'm I'm working with a much darker value here. And I, as I said, my process is to start with the larger shapes and lighter values and then work towards darker values, smaller shapes, more details. And I go down in my brush size. I start with larger brushes normally and work down to smaller brushes as I start doing detail. But it's, it's hard to, to follow this process if you get too dark too early. And if you... Uh, just put a big wash over the entire paper and basically create yourself toned paper then it limits your opportunities to fully explore the, va the full uh, range of values because if you tone your whole paper now you've lost the ability to have white in your composition and quite possibly some of the uh, uh, light range of values also so it's nice when you can go the full value range and go from white to very dark but when you just put a big wash over the entire paper and don't paint around some white areas and save those, you, you've really lost your opportunity to fully explore the, the complete value range, value scale. Another approach, which is completely acceptable if you're going to put a big wash over your paper, is to plan first to do some masking in some of the key areas of your composition. 
where you want to preserve the whites. I mean, it's a completely acceptable technique. You just have to do some upfront planning. And you can see the brushwork that I'm doing now in some of the areas that I, I want to represent with darker values, whether it be shadowed areas or areas underneath the, the building that are up on uh, wooden stilts. You can see that uh, I like to make brush marks and I don't necessarily paint whole shapes. I'll leave areas incomplete or I'll, I'll make a linear brush mark and I'll stop and start it and, and try to create lost and found edges and just create breaks in some of the shapes. It just keeps it more interesting. And what I'm doing right now is really working in negative space. So I'm doing some negative painting here to start to help define that building structure. I'm not really painting on the building structure. It's the space uh, behind it, under it, and around it that I'm working with to bring out the shape, in this case, the side of this building. It's those darker values that I'm placing in negative space that starts to further define that building. And then it creates the, the more the sensation of depth underneath the building where you go back and it's sitting above the water. I'm going to bring in my reference photo here in the bottom left corner so you can see how this painting is developed in relation to the uh, photograph that I'm using. Obviously I'm not trying to copy my photograph. I'm using this as reference and I'm just trying to give my interpretation of this scene using a, a limited palette. I'm capturing the major shapes and some of the value patterns in the composition, some of the areas that are light and dark, and capturing the distance. But I'm not trying to capture the, in detail the boards or necessarily every little item that's laying around on the ground. I'm just trying to give the suggestion of this scene and through my interpretation and my composition. Sometimes when I'm working on scenes that have uh, the suggestion of reflection of water, I'll make these types of brush marks and then I'll use a directional spray to bring it down into the water to give that suggestion of uh, the, the value reflecting down into the water. I'm going to come in with my quill brush here and a darker value and give a indication of a, a nearer tree line than what I'm showing with a darker value and it helps define a little bit more the, the water lot the the shoreline there that's in the distance behind this structure. One of the things I want to point out as I put that shoreline is I want to make sure that the, that that line for the shore is either below or above the peak of the roof of that building. If it ran right into the uh, line that is the roof of the building, it would create a very undesirable tangent. So in this case, I've made it lower than the building, and that way I avoid a very undesirable tangent. I have froze this picture so I can talk again about tangents. If you look right to the left where the tip of my brush is, there's a pole which is coming up from the building through the trees up into the sky. If you look at that pole in the photograph, you'll notice two things. It's a little small, but you can make it out. One, that pole stops directly at the top edge of that tree line. Two, that pole is centered directly at the intersection of the two roof lines from those building structures. Both of those situations are bad design. Both of those are tangents the top of the pole ending right at the top of the tree line and the pole splitting right down the middle between the two buildings. Those are undesirable uh, tangents in, your, in the composition. Now if you look at my painting, the way I've drawn it, that pole has been shifted to the left so that it doesn't end right at the intersection of the two roof lines. And the top of the pole goes above the tree line is not no longer even with the tree line. So I've modified my drawing so that I can avoid those two undesirable tangents that are there in the photograph.
So all of this so far has been done with various mixtures of sap green and royal blue. And royal blue is a PB60 pigment. It's often known as Delft blue and dantherine blue or endantherone blue in some of the other manufacturers. And I use that a lot when I want to darken uh, the value of a mixture. I use it in a number of my uh, painting mixtures that I use in my paintings. You can see here as I give a little bit more indication of this tree line behind this building that just those few marks I've put to suggest the trees helps give further definition to the structure itself. That darker value behind it, it's a negative shape behind this building and it helps bring it forward. And I like to work around my entire composition uh, making some of these smaller shapes and brush marks with darker values and develop the whole painting as a whole. I'm not necessarily in all instances trying to paint something that I see in the photograph and a lot of times I'm just trying to take a larger shape and break it into smaller components with what I feel is interesting brushwork and it captures the essence of what I see in my reference photograph but it may not be uh, mark for mark exactly what I'm seeing. Here I'm putting some just some dark, dark brush marks on the underside of uh, the shadowed area under the roof and now I'm, I'm painting the shadow side of that chimney and I opted to break that mark up uh, intentionally just to provide interest. And now there's a shadow there cast by that chimney. And as I make some of these marks, I look for opportunities to help strengthen other shapes. For instance, right now where I'm painting this little window back here, there's a break. And it helps the eye continue that line that's coming down from the pole. Even though I haven't painted any on that line, the, the negative space behind it is helping to find that, that linear mark, that linear shape. So as I make these brush marks, I often put them in a position where I can help further define other shapes. This dark area that I'm working in right now, by putting some of these dark marks, it starts to give the impression of uh, items sitting on this dock, but I'm not necessarily trying to paint the individual things that I see on the dock just capture the essence of the, the volume and the shape that's there and the values. And here just a little mark helps strengthen uh, that edge that's going into the, the other uh, wall of this building and just that mark helps further define the edge of that building without actually painting it on the edge itself. Sometimes it's surprising how just a few small marks give enough indication for the viewer to understand what they're looking at or what you want them to believe they're looking at. Now here, there's some rocks on this shoreline and I'm not going to render every rock. I'm just trying to give the suggestion of a rocky shoreline with some of these dark value shapes and that's not... Uh, an area where I really want the viewer to spend a lot of time. I want them to understand what's there and give that suggestion of the rocks, but my focal point is is up on the structure and not this rocky shoreline. So I'm not going to go crazy trying to define and render every rock that is in my photograph. As I make some of these brush marks I try to keep an awareness about uh, the proximity where I'm putting some of these. I'm working with darker values and I'm placing some of these by pure white paper which gives the greatest contrast. That's why often your whitest whites and darkest darks are in your uh, center of interest or focal point for your composition because it draws the viewer in and it's often the area where you have the most amount of detail. I've darkened my mixture a bit more with the royal blue 
as I said, I start light and work darker and darker as I go. And one of the things you have to keep in mind is when watercolor dries, it dries lighter than when you apply it. And sometimes we have in our mind the value that uh, the, the brush mark was when you put it down wet. And, it, and if it, once it dries, it's much lighter. And we lose track of the fact sometimes that it, it did get lighter. And it's not as dark as we, we really think it is. And so just be aware of that and make sure that you've gone uh, as dark as you can go when you're trying to fully explore the value ring. So in your mind, don't have it. You've gone with a, an eight or nine on the value scale. And once it's dry, it's a six or seven and you fail to recognize that. So just be, be aware of the fact that watercolor dry is much lighter than uh, it appears when you apply it wet. Right now I'm moving around my composition making some of these smaller dark valued brush marks and I put them in places where I can use them to help further define a shape or an edge. You can see just putting them under the, the roof line and, and touching on the top of that just helps further define the edges or the shapes of the, the building structures or the architectural features. A little touch in the window, uh, a little bit on the edge, just helps further define for the viewer what's going on there. I'm not telling the whole story, but there's enough information for the viewer to understand what I'm trying to suggest. You can see here just some dark valued linear, linear marks, some short, some long, help further define that shadowed area under the building. And I work around my composition and try and get a balance of that value so that it's working in all areas of my painting, but I try to put most of it in the area where I really want to draw the viewer into. And you can see I vary the length of my brush strokes, and even if I'm going to put a mark along uh, a longer linear mark, I'll break it up into a number of smaller segments. I normally do my sketch with a 2B pencil, and I'll reach a point in my painting process where it's giving me enough information to get my painting off to a good start and I'll decide that I want to erase the pencil marks. So I'll take a needed rubber eraser and I'll remove the pencil marks. And I don't always get rid of all of the marks. Sometimes a trace of a mark left. And that doesn't really bother me. In fact, sometimes it gives a little character to the piece. But uh, once I remove those lines, then I can start to really see my lost edges and see where the shapes um, start to come together and you know, the softness of edges and the, the lost and found nature of edges and it's somewhat con, uh, constrained when those pencil marks are still there. Here's another example where working with a darker value behind another shape starts to send that uh, uh, another shape, in this case the building structure, forward. And I'm going to use a fine mist spray to soften that up a little bit. Here I'm just taking a, a medium sized round brush with a middle value wash and I'm going to take some water and soften that up a little bit and let it gradate down the edge of that building and just trying to tie that shape together a little bit more I'm going to take some of that middle value down in some other areas to help uh, again tie some of these areas together a little bit more I want to tone the side of this building down a little bit with a darker value and I'm going to take some of that uh, same value wash up in this um, structure in the back and put a little darker tone on that um, the plane of that that edge that side of the building and you can see I didn't just paint the whole whole shape I left it broke up a little bit with a little bit of light in there just to provide some interest and you don't have to explain why you did that you can like make marks and uh, give suggestions of shapes wherever you choose to, wherever you think it will improve your composition or make it more interesting. 
contouring the surface of a shape is another way to, to further define for the viewer what's going on. I continue this process of layering washes and building my values, making my brush marks to define the, the shapes throughout my composition until I reach a point where I feel that I have communicated my interpretation of the scene as I see it. And at this point I've decided I'm going to put some graphics on the side of this building. Sometimes I do, sometimes I don't when I have a, a subject like this. But I decide in this case I'm going to. I don't want to be too trite. And I want to do it in a manner that's consistent with how I've painted the painting. So I'm not just going to put this on there like it's handwriting. I'm going to break up the letters with linear marks just as I have throughout my painting. So I've got that on there. I'm just going to touch it with a tissue again to make it a little bit more consistent with the rest of my painting. And that completes this version of Lobster Shack. So I'm going to place a white mat over it. And there you have the completed painting. Be sure to check out my Facebook group, Brick Swords Watercolor, friends and subscribers. And if you have questions about my materials, you can always go to the studio page on my website, rsurwitzart.com. If you have specific questions, you can email me at contactrsurwitzart at gmail.com. Thanks for watching.